Welcome. This webinar will review the world's energy situation. We will begin with a basic overview of the various ways that mankind presently acquires and harnesses energy. Since ecofusion is a new type of clean nuclear energy, this webinar will include a review of how the older technology of nuclear fission operates in order to later clearly show how superior the fusion reaction is in meeting our energy needs. We'll then take a quick look at presenting competing proposals for new ways of getting energy, which will lead us to a discussion of the great promise that is fusion energy. The promise of fusion energy has been around for decades, and the webinar will discuss what has been the leading fusion technology for the past 50 years, the tokamak. We'll look at the basic mechanism underlying tokamak operation and discuss the main reason why we don't get our energy from it right now. We will then present the main idea of ecofusion and wrap up this webinar with some con concluding remarks. Please note that this website also contains a companion introductory webinar entirely devoted to ecofusion, which we encourage you to view after you complete this more general overview. Our energy review begins with the question of how we get energy today. The history of mankind's use of energy naturally starts with hydro and wind power. Water-based mills and windmills were used for hundreds of years to use the force of moving water and wind to turn blades to provide power for various uses. Today, such moving blades are used to turn generators to make electricity. In the Industrial Revolution, Mankind learned to harness fossil fuels to produce steam-based engines, and ultimately the internal combustion engines, jet engines, and rockets to power various needs. In the 1950s, the advent of traditional nuclear fission arrived that utilized the great energy stored in atomic nuclei to power steam-driven plants for the creation of electricity. More recently, solar power has been making progress, wherein light excites electrons within materials in such a way that electricity can be harnessed. Both fossil fuels and solar power create energy by a rearrangement of electrons within matter. Here we see a picture of an atom. All normal matter here on Earth is made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of a centrally positively charged nucleus, as well as negatively charged electrons that orbit about that nucleus. It is a well-known fact that opposite charges attract, and therefore it takes energy to move the electrons further from the nucleus. In some molecules, such as gasoline, the electrons are further away from the nucleus than others, such as carbon dioxide or water. That is why the burning of gasoline results in energy being produced. The energy that is released as the electrons move closer to the nucleus is converted into motion, which becomes heat which is then used to make steam or to push turbines. Solar cells work slightly differently. In that case, light pushes the electrons temporarily further away from the nucleus, and then later electricity is produced when the electrons are returned to their closer position. Here we see a diagram of nuclear fission. In fission, a neutron collides with a uranium nucleus and causes it to split into two daughter nuclei as well as three additional neutrons. It is the daughter nuclei that often produce the long-lived radioactive waste which is a problem for the nuclear fission reaction. The three neutrons then go on to interact with additional uranium nuclei to produce a chain reaction, liberating energy in the process. It is the presence of this chain reaction that has caused accidents in the past. Basically, a fission reactor is a means to carefully control a chain reaction, and that is where the danger lies. Since the force holding the nucleus together is millions of times larger than the force holding the electron into the atom, the energy released in the nuclear process is millions of times larger per atom than is the energy released by fossil fuels. As was the case with the electrons in the atom, it is the rearrangement of the particles that causes the energy release. In the case of nuclear reactions, it is the rearrangement of the protons and neutrons within the nucleus that causes the enormous energy release of a nuclear reaction. 
Next, we'll take a bit deeper look at the presently available energy sources, comparing advantages and disadvantages from each approach. Presently, the world gets much of its energy needs from fossil fuels. Fossil fuels have some very strong advantages. The fuels have a high density of stored energy and therefore can be used in transportation. Fossil fuels can be burned when and where we want to burn them, allowing for on-demand power at all times. Lastly, fossil fuels have a cost that is low compared to alternative fuels. But fossil fuels also have disadvantages. Fossil fuels produce carbon dioxide and mankind's use of these fuels have led to a change in the chemical content of the Earth's atmosphere as a result. Furthermore, the supply of fossil fuels is limited, and the era of cheap oil is likely coming to an end in the very near future. Also, the supply of fossil fuels is found only in certain locations on the Earth, resulting in a situation where some nations have advantages and others disadvantages when it comes to this vital energy resource. With the disadvantages of fossil fuels, solar, hydro, and wind power are presently considered advantageous to pursue. This is because they result in no emissions and the raw power source is freely available. However, these energy sources have drawbacks as well. The sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. Utilizing these energy sources on the scale needed to provide for the world's energy needs would require an enormous amount of land and diverted rivers leaving a very large ecological footprint on the Earth. Also, the energy density of these sources is quite small compared to fossil fuels, so these energy sources are not likely to be competitive in the transportation sector. Lastly, if these energy sources were the answer to the world's needs, they would already be implemented more than they already are. The problem is that they are not cost competitive when compared to fossil fuels. The final source of traditional energy to discuss is nuclear fission. Nuclear fission has the advantages of producing millions of times more power per atom than is produced by fossil fuels while simultaneously resulting in no carbon dioxide emissions. Unfortunately, nuclear fission has disadvantages as well. Nuclear fission uses materials that can be easily diverted into nuclear weapons. The fission process results in long-lived radioactive waste. There have been rather severe nuclear accidents associated with fission plants, and nuclear fission is not useful for transportation needs. It was seen in the preceding discussion that none of the present approaches to achieving energy is ideal, and hence there has been quite a large interest in any new approach that presents itself. One class of approaches deals with creating energy out of plant matter, and this class includes biomass, ethanol, cellulosic, and algae. The advantage of these approaches is that they do not produce carbon dioxide on a net basis, since the plants take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to grow, and then burning results in the fuel putting the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. But these approaches have drawbacks as well. In order to produce energy on the scale needed by a fully industrialized society, much agricultural land will need to be devoted toward fuel generation, and these techniques have not proven to be cost-effective to date. Another possibility that achieves great interest from time to time is hydrogen power. Hydrogen is interesting because it produces no carbon dioxide and it can be used for transportation, but it is not a power source in the way fossil fuels are. Hydrogen must first be produced by putting energy into water to split the hydrogen out, and the energy that is put in is slightly greater than the energy taken out when the hydrogen is burned. Hence, hydrogen is really only a battery, not a power source. The last energy source to discuss is nuclear fusion. Here we see a picture of the process of nuclear fusion. The reaction of most interest involves deuterium, colliding with tritium to make helium and a neutron, as well as some excess energy. Unlike fission, which relies on a chain reaction to split atomic nuclei, fusion occurs when atomic nuclei are combined. Hence, the fusion reaction is inherently safe. Yet, similar to fission, 
the fusion reaction produces millions of times more energy than fossil fuels. Nuclear fusion is known to have many significant advantages. Since the fuel is found in water and has millions of times more stored energy than fossil fuels, the fuel supply is essentially inexhaustible. There are no carbon dioxide emissions and no long-lived radioactive waste is directly produced in the reactions. The fusion reaction does not use materials that can be made into fission bombs and the fusion reaction is safe with no possibility of runaway accidents that have unfortunately occurred with fission reactors. The one disadvantage of fusion is that present reactor designs are too large to consider using in transportation. But once a cheap source of clean electricity is available by using fusion, it is clearly possible to make hydrogen for our transportation needs. Hence, fusion energy has long been considered to be the best possible solution to the world's energy needs. With the high promise of fusion, research has been underway since the 1950s to develop a practical device to bring the promise to reality. The leading research device has been the tokamak, which attempts to trap particles within a donut-shaped magnetic field and heat those particles to a high temperature to enable fusion. The intended process is not too different from that which occurs in the sun and stars where high temperatures get the hydrogen ions to high enough velocities to cause fusion. In the sun and stars, gravity keeps the hydrogen dense enough to enable high fusion rates. In the tokamak, magnetic fields are intended to keep the density high. Unfortunately, particle collisions within the tokamak lead to losses that have kept the tokamak from fulfilling its promise. Researchers have felt that we are 20 years away from a commercial tokamak reactor but they have felt that way for the past 50 years. Ecofusion is a new approach to generating fusion energy. Rather than trying to confine a plasma with magnetic fields, Ecofusion relies on the science of particle storage rings to store beams of particles that are brought into collision. In this way, the deuterium and tritium can be accelerated to just the right speed so that all of the particles have the perfect energy for fusion to occur. Of course, using colliding beams for fusion is an almost obvious idea, and the reason it has not been pursued is primarily due to the high level of space charge neutralization required. It is well known that opposite charges attract and that like charges repel. Forming beams requires that all of the particles are charged in the same way, which would lead to very large forces would th that would destroy the beams if this effect is not countered. In ecofusion, designs have been included to introduce particles of the opposing sign to effectively cancel out the charge of the beams used in the device. Here we see an animation of the ecofusion device. Deuterons indicated in blue, are sent in from a deuteron ion source into the storage rings on the far ends of this device. The deuterons then cycle around the device, and each time they come around, more deuterons are added, developing a very large current within the ecofusion system. In the middle ring, tritons, shown in yellow, are put into their ring. Again, the tritons cycle around the ring with more tritons being added on each pass throughout the device. In this way, both the deuterium and triton currents become very large indeed. In the system, there are overlapping regions where the beams can collide with one another. Focusing elements within those regions focus the beams to very small spot sizes, maximizing the amount of fusion energy that comes out of the device. Ecofusion has been studied in great detail. A several hundred page document will be submitted for publication soon. In that document, all the scattering processes important for the Ecofusion system are analyzed. These scattering processes include scattering between the colliding beams, scattering between the beams and residual gas atoms left in the system, scattering between the beams and trapped neutralizing particles within the beams, and scattering within the beams themselves. The ion optics of the beams is used to determine all of the required magnetic fields
and a study of all possible resonant and instability phenomena has been analyzed. The effect of the ion beams recombining with the electron beam to form neutral particles is evaluated, as is the formation of neutral particles from charge exchange with the residual gas atoms in the system. An hour-long review of all of this detail has been presented to several scientific audiences and is available for viewing under the full scientific presentation tab on this website. The conclusion of the analysis is that the ecofusion system is expected to be able to achieve 10 times more energy output than is required to run the device. Here we see a slide comparing tokamak and ecofusion parameters. As can be seen, ecofusion proposes to use smaller currents and has a smaller output power and smaller size than a tokamak. This combination of attributes will make ecofusion much easier to demonstrate and work with in laboratory environments. Ecofusion also has the advantage that all particles have just the right energy for fusion to occur, and the confinement mechanism of using particle beams is well studied and in an advanced scientific state. In conclusion, it is widely appreciated that present world energy sources have serious long-term problems. Fossil fuels have a limited supply and produce greenhouse gases. Solar, wind, and hydro need large amounts of land to supply our needed power, and the sources are unreliable. Fission produces wastes and can lead to weapons. Therefore, the world needs fusion. Fusion promises an inexpensive, inexhaustible source of fuel, results in no emissions, and there is no direct production of long-lived nuclear waste. Lastly, fusion does not require weapons-grade materials in order for its operation. For more details on ecofusion, please continue with the next webinar, which will go into considerably more detail on a new way to achieve clean, cheap, and safe nuclear power.